John Gay's The Beggar's Opera. John Gay, English poet and dramatist, chiefly remembered as the author of The Beggar's Opera, a work distinguished by good humored satire and technical assurance. A member of an ancient but impoverished Devonshire family, Gay was educated at the Free Grammar School in Barnstable. He was apprenticed to a silk mercer in London but was released early from his indentures and, after a further short period in Devonshire, returned to London, where he lived most of his life. Among his early literary friends were Aaron Hill and Ostes Bajal whom he helped in the production of the British Apollo, a question and answer journal of today. Gay's journalistic interests are clearly seen in a pamphlet, The Present State of Wit, a survey of contemporary periodicals publications. His most successful play was The Baker's Opera, produced in London on January 29, 1728, by the theatre manager John Rich at Lincoln's in Fields Theatre. It ran for 62 performances, not consecutive, but the longest run then known. A story of thieves and highwaymen, it was intended to mirror the moral degradation of society and more particularly to caricature the Prime Minister Sir Robert Walpole and his weak administration. It also made fun of the prevailing fashion for Italian opera. The play was stage-worthy, however, not so much because of its pungent satire, but because of its effective situations and singable songs. The production of its sequel, Polly, was forbidden by, by the Lord Chamberlain, doubtless on Walpole's instructions, but the ban was an excellent advertisement for the piece and subscriptions for copies of the printed edition made more than £1,000 profit for the author. It was eventually produced in 1777, when it had a moderate success. His Beggar's Opera was successfully transmitted into the 20th century by Bertolt Brecht and Kurt Weill as the Dry Groschen Opera. 1928, The Three Penny Opera. The Beggar's Opera, a ballad opera in three acts by John Gay, performed at Lincoln's In Fields Theatre, London, in 1728, and published in the same year. The work combines comedy and political satire in prose, interspersed with Songs set to contemporary and traditional English, Irish, Scottish and French tunes. In it, Gay portrays the lives of a group of thieves and prostitutes in 18th century London. The action centers on Picum, a fence for stolen goods, Polly, his daughter, and Mackett, a highwayman. Gay caricatures the government, fashionable society, and marriage and Italian operatic style. Particularly evident are parallels made between the moral degeneracy of the opera's protagonists and contemporary high-born society. The term beggar's opera, like Newgate Pastoral, alerts the audience to Gay's intention to challenge and subvert traditional practices. Opera was concerned with elevated characters who lived and loved in heroic fashion. Nothing could be further from the world of beggars, taverns and Newgate prison. Gay deliberately mixes ideas of high and low culture. The opening conversation between the beggar and the actor makes us conscious of the incongruity and reminds us that this is the word of the burlesque. Thus it begins and as it will end with the absurd. Opera was very fashionable at the time, but it did come in for some criticism. Swift's comment on its popularity was largely to, due to its spectacular costumes and stage effects and the exotism of the Italian singers. Contemporary dramatists were concerned that the popularity of Italian opera would lead to a decline in English drama. Gay pokes fun at the imported passion for opera and its artifici artificiality and remoteness from real life. 
He parodies and inverts the values of the operatic world. Rather than celebrating the lives of the great, he takes the hypocrisy into grief and power struggles of polite society and translates them to the criminal underworld. This is done partly to, through the complex parallels between figures of the criminal underworld and contemporary political figures, but also through the muse of, use of music. Gay celebrates English ballads in contrast to Italian opera, exploiting popular airs such as green sleeves associated with traditional English values. David Noggs emphasizes the importance of music in the piece, arguing in raillery and rage that the play's real lyrical qualities give it the humor of a broader humanity, which transforms the attacks upon individual politicians into a festival of traditional values. The play works both on a specific contemporary level and on a wider timeless level. The themes. Equality. Gates' exploration of equality has an inherent in irony to it, and understanding this irony is essential to appreciating the sharpness of his satire, For both explicitly through dialogue and implicitly through the story, Gay critiques the outright inequality between the rich and poor. However, what makes the work unique is that he makes in incessant comparisons between the powerful rich and the desperate poor. His basic idea is that, despite social class, all men are naturally self-interested and corrupt. The text is rife with humorous equivalences drawn between statesmen and criminals, lawyers and impatriots, highwaymen and courtiers, to all to suggest that inequality is, to, is due as much to how hypocritical a man is willing to be, and not to his virtue. Marriage. In the world of the beggar's opera, marriage bears no resemblance to the romantic notion of a holy union between two soulmates. Instead, Gay continually mocks this notion, suggesting that love is more closely aligned with lust and self-interest than with self selfishness. The closest Gay comes to representing the idealized conception is in the profuse professions Polly and Lucy make for McElty. However, both women are as focused on physical intimacy as upon a transcendent union. Polly's marriage ultimately means little to McElty, and most characters think of it is in terms of its financial benefits, with little thought of her emotions. The girl's notion of romantic love, so misplaced upon an obvious cat, renders the romantic ideal ludicrous. Friendship. There are mirrored instances of friendship in the opera, although none of them confirm the, to the ideal notion of a selfless affection for another, instead most characters are quick to better betray even the most seemingly profound of relationships. As a virtue, friendships, friendship is as posed by Pecum for Lockheed and vice versa, the highwayman for each other, the harem of ladies for one another, Mrs. Pecum for her favorite gang members, and even Lucy for Polly. In each case, though, the affection proves at best a transitory kind of fidelity dictated utterly by self-interest. Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is arguably Gay's most significant target in the opera. Both implicitly and explicitly, he mocks the way that statesmen reach great heights not through virtue but through their hypocrisy. In fact, hypocrisy defines each and every character, action and employment, suggesting it is an inherent, inescapable human quality. Gay's lyrics are the best place to find witty articulations of his time's hypocrisy. Live for today. The criminal mindset is greatly bolstered by the view that tomorrow may never come. It is not just criminals who use such reasoning to justify morally ambiguous actions, of course. 
Instead, Gay suggests that we all encounter situations where we compromise ourselves for the sake of momentary gratification. Consider the scene between Lucy and Polly. The morally bankrupt characters of the Baker's opera, however, take a sanguine view of the matter. The news is in everyone's future. Thus, let us live for today. While Gay does not explicitly comment on living one's life through this philosophy, he does implicitly suggest that it is a natural human rationalization. The law. There is no question that the profession receiving the worst review in the Baker's opera is law enforcement. The officers of the court are bravable men who regularly suppress evidence in criminal prosecution for the right price. Quite explicitly, justice is for sale and a malleable concept at best. Worst of all are the lawyers, repeatedly invoked throughout the play as the prime example of those who profit by the wise of others. One day they protect the unsavory, the next they prosecute them. It all depends on the price. If anything serves as an immovable law in the Becker's opera, is the natural law of human selfishness. Self-awareness. The characters in Be the Becker's opera are prone to a philosophical defensiveness against their own dishonesty. It is as though they are aware and of and armed against the audience gaze. This defensiveness utilizes deflection. The characters often co confess their own moral failings or treachery, but then divert the attack to die their social betters. If murder is wrong, for example, then look to the gentlemen who have the money to employ assistance or pay off the police. If Mackay has a gambling problem, blame the gentlemen at the same table whose educations prepare them more properly for the games and whose pocket books may more easily take a hit. Gay implicitly suggests in his play that we would all do better to look closely to at ourselves rather than to define ourselves by others, since others will naturally and regularly give us much, much occasion to defend our own vices and failures.